back. Uh, and after we begin, uh, before we begin, I would like to proceed and uh, give a few reminders and general announcements. We would like to acknowledge the organizations and companies who supported the Abu Dhabi International Mental Health Conference. And they are Janssen, Lundbeck, Tabuk Pharmaceuticals, Exeltis, Comex, and Pfizer Upjohn. The conference is accredited by the European Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education for 23 CME hours. And it's recognized by the Department of Health, Abu Dhabi, Ministry of Health and Prevention, Dubai Health Authority, and the GCC Health Authorities. The delegates can choose either one of the tracks simultaneously played throughout the duration of the event. And note that the CME hours will be calculated based on the number of hours spent streaming in the online platform. We encourage everyone to also participate and vote for the best poster. Delegates can vote via the using the poll system and the virtual platform. For the best poster, we will receive special prize. Be the most interactive person of the day by asking questions, visiting the exhibition area, talking with company representatives, using the online platform, and stay until the end of the entire program for a chance to win a smartwatch. Use the ask question tab in the meeting hall for any questions related to the lectures. Our expert speakers and moderators will try their best to answer them during the panel discussion. Also try to visit the sponsor's virtual booth at the exhibition hall. The delegates can chat or video to call via the sponsor's chat box. The agenda of the conference can be accessed on either the bottom panel of your screen or corner menus. Please feel free to navigate the online platform for the maximum virtual experience. Today's program will end at 20.05. And now I would like to uh, call the chairman of the session uh, for today, uh, Dr. Mufid Raouf, the consultant psychiatrist in Suleiman Al Habib Hospital, Dubai, UAE, and Dr. Hawra Sajwani who is a consultant psychiatrist at Sheikh Khalifa Medical City. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and I have to start with, I have to thank all the uh, seniors, colleagues, and friends in the organizing committee of the conference for giving me the honor and the pleasure of still being a member of this wonderful family who have been organizing and conducting this wonderful Congress on an annual basis. Thank you so much. And uh, I believe deep in my heart, it's gonna be as successful, if not more than the previous Congresses that we had. Uh, Dr. Hawra will be with me. She's a, a very dear colleague and daughter to me. And uh, we will start uh, without uh, further ado, by uh, presenting the first speaker. We will have three speakers, actually. The three of them are senior professors from Egypt, very dear to us. They are almost always have been sharing with us in our Congresses. And the first talk is gonna be to Professor Hisham Rami about the brain and depression, uh, the untold story. Professor Rami is the professor of psychiatry in Ain Shams University and the consultant psychiatrist in UK. He is the Secretary General of Egyptian Psychiatric Association and Vice President of the Egyptian Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And he had more than 30 publications in, in international and national journals. And he had attended several national and international uh, received awards. And he has been a supervisor of various uh, masters and doctorate uh, uh, trainings in psychiatry. And he has been providing training in psychiatry for undergraduate and postgraduate and he has a membership of various national and international professional associations. Please welcome with me, uh, Professor uh, Rami, to talk about the brain and depression. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank you all for attending this important symposium regarding depression. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of this important conference which has been held annually for the last almost 10 years and it's successful holding every year particularly 
my two friends, Professor Tariq Darwish and Professor Medhat Sabahi. I would also extend my thanks to the chairpersons of this important session and the other speakers with me. My presentation today is going to discuss the brain and depression from a concept of what are the untold stories about the relationship between the brain and depression. Allow me first to start with this picture of a very famous lady, J.K. Rowling, who is the author of Harry Potter. In, in, in her story, she said that there is always an untold story worth telling. This is why I chose the title of my presentation as the untold story of the relationship between brain and depression. Also, it seems that J.K. Rowling, before be becoming a famous author, got divorced and was living as a single mother in one of the council houses in the UK, and she was suffering from severe stress and she suffers from depression. She described, as she has repeatedly stated, her experience with depression in her stories about Harry Potter. If all of you can remember a creature called the mentors in, the, in those stories, she described them as black creatures that invade your brain and steal all your thoughts, your emotions, and your perception, and all your what is known as cognitive functions. She said that this is how the, she felt depression is. So we might say that this is a story telling us that depression seems to be invading our brains. Historically, there was no mention regarding the relationship between depression and brain till the late 19th century and the start of the 20th century. If you go back in the history of the pharaohs and the old Egyptians, we find that they thought that depression resulted from a certain disturbance in the heart, and they related it to what is known as a black heart, where you are invaded by blackness and your heart is always sad. So they did not mention the, the brain, but they concentrated on the heart and they had many treatments for this. Then in the Greek era, with Hippocrates, with his humoral theory about the four fluids and the relationship to health and disease, he believed that depression resulted from the spleen for no apparent reason except that this was his theory. And he postulated that depression results from excessive secretion of black bile from the spleen, which leads to all the symptoms of depression. So the concept of blackness started from the pharaohs and the heart, then the Greeks, blackness and the spleen. Then of course, in the Middle Ages, started the, the, the hypothesis that all mental illnesses, including depression, resulted from being possessed by an evil spirit or by an evil genie, whatever, it was a possession disease that needed religious exorcism. This also was in our culture up till now, I think. Then in the 17th and 18th century, a very interesting theory about how depression result was postulated by Antoine Mesmer in Vienna. He believed that people who are depressed have an obstruction of the flow of the natural energy that is flowing through their body and that in order to treat this you have to overcome this obstruction and he postulated that certain people have certain powers which he termed animal magnetism and when this magnetic energy is directed to the person who is suffering from depression it will relieve the obstruction and the patient will recover from his depression or her depression of course, we all know that this became later on known as hypnosis and its effect on relieving psychiatric ailments. Interestingly, this hypothesis about energy continued till the early 20th century with this psychiatrist, William Reich, who has one of the strangest haircuts in the history of psychiatry. Instead of saying that it's animal magnetism and the flow of theory, he postulated there is a certain energy he turned or he called orgone, and that obstruction of this orgone or the flow of this energy will result in depression. So he invented many instruments to treat depression. One of them was called orgone blanket, orgone accumulator, and orgone box and orgone shooter. Interestingly, many people actually sought help with this psychiatrist who ended in jail actually at the end. Then, in the late 19th century, and the 
in the late 19th century and a German physician who was actually specialized in tropical medicine and who actually worked in Egypt for a while at the time of Khidiwi uh, Abbas al Awal went back to Berlin and he decided to work in mental disorders. He believed, and this was the first time there was mentioning of the relationship between brain and depression. He believed and postulated that depression and all mental illnesses are actually diseases of the brain and that if we carefully examine the brains of people with mental illness we will discover that there, there is pathology in the brain of course the tools available at that time did not show the abnormalities he predicted but he was the first person to say that mental disorders including depression are actually diseases of the brain exactly like neurological disorders interestingly he was not a neurologist but he was a physician specialized in tropical medicine almost at the same time of years later a neurologist Sigmund Freud decided that the brain has no relationship to mental illness and including depression and he postulated of course you all know his theory about the psyche and the conscious and the unconscious and the id and the and stuff and decided that mental illnesses are functional disorders and they have nothing to do with actual brain pathology and of course his theory about depression led to as you all are familiar with is related to libidinal energy fixation and anger towards the self or anger directed towards inward his theory dominated how we view depression and psychiatric disorders till the 1950s when accidental discovery that one of the anti-tuberculous drugs used to treat di tuberculosis in TB sanatoriums led to relief of the negative emotions that was accompanying the tuberculosis in some of the patients and they discovered that the group of patients which I am quoting what was written were dying happily, happily and coughing blood while smiling were taking INH or isoniazide which is one of the anti tuberculous drugs and they postulated that it might have an antidepressant effect and then people started to think that maybe depression is a chemical disorder in the brain almost at the same time or a very few years later Ronald Kuhn who was working with schizophrenic patients with a molecule which was derived from chlorpromazine or from the same class like chlorpromazine antihistaminics trying to discover a new antipsychotic found out that people who were treated did not have improvement in their psychotic symptoms but actually became more animated more likely to react their depressive manifestations or their sadness started to improve and this was the discovery that amipramine also led to the improvement in depressive symptoms and hence started what is known as the chemical theory of depression and that chemicals in the brain have a relationship to it. and of course this was the start of the monoamine hypothesis of depression which result which first was hypothesized to be it's related to either decrease or decrease in neuron transmitters then it became more complicated with dysregulation of certain circuits morphological changes and that there are certain receptors which are affected then we started to look at the brain and we asked the, a very important question is the depressed brain different from a non-depressed brain or not and we have evidence now that the depressed brain have structural pathology and actually also functional structural pathology mainly decreased volume of specific regions reduced in neuronal size and reduced in the number of synaptic and connections and regarding using functional techniques like functional MRI and PET scan and SPECT we now know that there is dysregulated connectivity which I'm going to go through it very quickly now several meta-analysis have been done and several studies have been done that showed that in depressed patients there is decrease in the gray matter with increase in the size of the ventricle these are some of the studies which have shown this and they have shown that several areas are affected including the hippocampus including the frontal gray matter including orbitofrontal gray matter codate 
putamen, globus pallidus, and thalamus. So we now know that there is accumulating evidence that the gray matter is affected in patients with depression. We also now have some evidence that in the prefrontal cortex of people with major depression, the synaptic density is decreased. And I'm not going to go through the details because we have only 20 minutes to go through all presentations. In addition to gray matter and synaptic density, we also know that there are white matter changes in major depression. From this study, two studies, we can show that glial cell changes are also apparent in people with the depression. We find that there is decrease in the glutamate transporter and increase in the what is known as astrocyte hypertrophy. Pointing to the fact that there is gray matter changes, as we have said before, and there is white matter changes affecting connectivity in the brain. The theory now is that the compromisation in the white matter integrity, which include the glial cells, particularly astrocytes, will damage the circuits of the brain and lead to dysfunctional connectivity and dysfunctional circuits, as we are, as shown in this slide. I'm not going through the details, but many circuits are affected because of the white matter changes. So we now know that there is decreased connectivity in key, re key regions in the depressed brain. Functional imaging study using functional MRI and PET scans have shown the following, that the amygdala activation was greater in people in those patients than in the controls, and the amygdala connectivity was reduced with its connections to the medial prefrontal cortex and the insula. And that less connectivity, the more the, the damage in this connectivity, the poorer the psychosocial function of those patients. Some, although this has not been proven yet, that we, if you use functional MRI, you can show that some of the changes in the brain connectivity patterns in major depression appears to have high sensitivity and high specificity. These studies are, of course, trying to be replicated now in the connectome project. However, we have to take this data very cautiously because up till now, we do not have a specific pattern in imaging that can help us in diagnosing depression. Although many data is coming out that might help us in the near future to have a specific brain imaging tool or an imaging biomarker to diagnose depression. But this is not true up till now, although the data as shown in this slide might point to this. So let's go to what is known as dendrites and the relationship between being exposed to stress and changes in the brain. We know that stress induces dendritic atrophy in rat models of depression and that being exposed to stress will lead to decrease in the number of dendrites and connectivity on the brain. And it has been hypothesized that this is related to the effect of stress on brain-derived neurotrophic factors. And that this, when it happens, will lead to decreased connectivity and decrease even the hippocampus. We know that decrease in BDNF will lead to dendritic atrophy and decrease in the size. And we now know that if we can increase the BDNF in the brains of depressed patients, this will lead to improvement in the depressive manifestations and even reversal of the brain changes, particularly in the hippocampus. And this led to what is known as the network hypothesis of depression. Importantly, when the hippocampus is affected due to stress and depression, it leads to neuroendocrine dysregulation, as we know, with increase in the level of cortisone, which actually will lead to more hippocampal damage and more dysregulation in this axis. And when this happens in the brain, the brain affects other systems in the body, including the cardiovascular system and the endocrine system, particularly the pancreas, leading to more incidence of diabetes and more incidence of cerebrovascular and cardiovascular accidents, as shown in this slide. It even affects the co coagulability of the blood. Another important finding that are emerging nowadays is that depression might be the result of inflammation in the brain, and that stress will lead to inflammatory processes which might increase your liability to depression, as shown in this slide, related to the cytokines and the allosteric level of certain kinetic pathway. 
This is very important, particularly in the time of COVID, where we know that coronavirus infection will lead to activation of the cytokines and the interleukins in the body and will lead to increase in the brain affection and actual increase in the incidence of depression in this current time. This is showing you that how, how inflammation and increased level of the cytokines will lead to decreased neurotransmitter metabolism, decreased neurogenesis, and increase in the glutamate exocytotoxicity, leading to alteration in the brain circuits that have been mentioned before, leading to depression. This is, is very important at the times of COVID with increased inflammatory, inflammatory reactions in the body. To recap, is there actually a difference about people the with depression regarding their brain in comparison to people without depression actually we have evidence that there are structural changes in the form of dendritic atrophy decreased neuronal density many changes are driven by activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and reduction in the bdnf levels and the cytokines and interleukins there is also altered connectivity, including the circuits related to monoamines and glutamate. There is disruption of the complex connections, interactions, and functions of circuits and neurotransmitters, and disturbance in the astrocyte functions. There is also altered susceptibility to stress and inflammation, as has been shown in the presentation. There is now emerging evidence that glutamate and GABA are playing a role in depression. This is why new treatments targeting glutamate and targeting GABA are showing promising results in the treatment of depression. We know that glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system and it's actually involved in all circuits that are related to depression. And there is growing body evidence that this regulation of glutamate will lead to depression and that Regulating glutamate and modulating its effect through its many receptors will lead to improvement of depression. The same applies to GABA and postpartum depression, actually. Another important question before ending my presentation. Are those structural and anatomical changes reversible or not reversible? Several studies have shown that if you improve depression, these are going to be reversed. And one or two studies have shown the opposite, that it doesn't is not related to improvement or remission. But it seems nowadays the evidence is pointing to the fact that brain volume changes will, may increase with sustained remission. It is not important just to attain the remission. It is important to have sustained remission because this will not only improve the quality of life and the functioning of the patients, but it will lead to reversal of the changes that happen in the brain. And this is very promising actually. We are now awaiting the results of the Human Connectome Project, which hopefully were not affected by the corona epidemic and they are not delayed because they will let us know actual brain changes in depression and which circuits are affected. And we might end up with what is known as specific and sensitive brain changes or a radiological biological mark. Also, several studies being done regarding what's happening intracellularly so that we might also understand what's happening at the micro level or nano level. And at the end, I would like to thank you and hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And thank you again for the chairpersons and the chairperson of the Congress, the Secretary General, and all my friends in the UEE. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rami. Uh, it's impressive and comprehensive and always enlightening as usual. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker. He's a very well known to us also, Professor Mumtaz Abdul Wahab, who is a professor of psychiatry at Cairo University. And he's the president of the Egyptian Psychiatric Association, president of the Arab Federation of Psychiatrists, president of the Regional Committee of Mental Health and the Ministry of Health. And he's the vice president of the Scientific Committee of Egyptian Board of Psychiatry and he is the chief editor of Egyptian Journal of Psychiatry. Professor Mumtaz will talk about depression as a disabling condition. Professor Mumtaz, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. 
at first I have to uh, thank uh, Dr. Tar and Dr. Uh, Medhat Sabahi for uh, inviting me to uh, give this lecture. My lecture is about treatment of resistant depression and I, I will give at first a rapid review about depression. Depression, it will uh, affect to 30 to 5% of people in lifetime prevalence. And it will vary from 10 to 30% of all the population. Depression is ranked by the WHO at the third highest cause of disability across the world, projected to become the second by 20. 20. Now, it is in this year, it can be considered as the second uh, cause of disability. Disability, Dallas, is uh, the days the, people, the, the patient will be absent from the work and uh, is uh, paralyzed and cannot uh, do his work. Uh, the highest rate of depression, it occurs in individuals between age 25 to 44 years. And female are, of course, almost twice the uh, men uh, affected by depression. If it is uh, in female, 10 to 25%, uh, the male are 5 to 12% uh, uh, to experience depression. Usually the female are more suspected and expected to be depressed uh, more than men. Untreated depression has significant economic, social, physical, and psychological consequence. The factors contribute to economic burden of depression include the prevalence of the disease, the disease is, uh, is affecting too many people, and so it affects the uh, economic. Uh, it also, the treatment rate, uh, even with the all types of treatment and all types of antidepressants, of course, we get only 60 to 70% recovery from the depression. The rate and degree of impairment reduced productivity and increased absenteeism. The depression will affect the productivity of the human being. It uh, increases the absenteeism from his work. He cannot do his work as uh, before. So there is decrease in the productivity. Higher rates of premature deaths related to cardiovascular disease and myocardial infarction. That's because the life of style, the increase in smoking, the sedentary life, also the, uh, the dieting, and also the effect of the drugs and the antidepressant, it increases the body weight and it uh, induces metabolic uh, syndrome. And this all will increase the rate of uh, myocardial infarction and cardiovascular disease. 15% of the people diagnosed with major depressive disorder will commit suicide. You see 15% will commit suicide. And two thirds of all suicides are related to depression. We have about million suicide in the world every year. 15%, uh, for, uh, two thirds of them are because of depression. And the 15% of the people will commit suicide. Uh, about 60% of the depressed are, have thoughts of uh, committing suicide or ending their life, but maybe because of their uh, faith, uh, they don't uh, do it. Depression is often recurrent. Usually, if you have an attack of depression, of course, you will get another attacks afterward. And at about 25 to 40% of the patients who are effectively treated for the first episode of depression will experience a recurrence within two years. And 60% will have recurrence within five years. Within five years, 60% of the depressed patient will have another attack. And during first two years, about quarter or half of the patients will have a second attack. Depression is often chronic about 20 to 35% of patients who experience one episode of depression have chronic depression and have treatment resistant depression. These figures, and this are, we are all know about it, it shows us how the people are 
uh, normal, this normal individual, then he will have depression, there is progression of the disorder, then there will be start if we start treatment in the acute phase from six to 12 uh, weeks, he will respond. Response means that the uh, depressive symptoms will decrease about 50% on Hamilton score. And then before he reach the uh, stable, the remission, if the symptoms recurs, this we called it, it is a relapse. If he reaches the remission, that's and uh, say that the uh, uh, symptoms appear and the patient uh, has uh, less than seven on ha uh, Hamilton. This we called it, it is class in the patient is in remission. And we have to continue to meet him for four to nine months. And if uh, there is another attack, it will call it recurrence. Here uh, we have to maintain the medicine for one year or more. First attack, we have to carry on our continue our treatment for one year or more. If there is second attack of the uh, depression, we have to give the patient treatment three to five years. If third attack, it is much better to continue in medication forever, all his life. Treatment failure is defined as lack of complete remission, non-remission with an appropriate treatment dose and trial duration as measured as Hamilton score less than seven or manic, uh, madras score of less than 10. If the patient after a good trial of treatment didn't reach the uh, remission, we called it a, as a treatment failure. And this treatment resistant depression it is the European Medicine Agency. This is our main subject. Defined it as a non-response to at least a two adequate antidepressant trial. We have to give the patient two adequate antidepressant trial and the patient will not respond. With antidepressant agents of the same or different substance uh, plus, either we give the patient tricyclic and SSRI or SSRI as SNRI, uh, the patient didn't improve on to adequate trial. To adequate trial, adequate trial means adequate treatment and adequate dose. Adequate treatment, uh, adequate dose means that the patient has the adequate dose and the adequate duration, it means that he has at the medicine for at least four weeks. In the patient is adherent to treatment and uh, compliant to the treatment. Because sometimes the non adherence will lead to uh, treatment and uh, resistant depression or chronic depression. There is pseudo resistance. What means that pseudo resistance? The patient is resistant to treatment, but this is due to cause that the, not the depression is not improved on medicin medications, but there is some fault, uh, some uh, defect in our management plan. We have to check the dose and the duration of the time. Maybe the duration will stop the medication or decrease the dose. Uh, before uh, the adequate time, uh, four weeks sometimes, we uh, after one week, two weeks, the patient feels that he is okay, then we reduce the dose. Or the patient is don't uh, use the medication as we prescribe. Uh, we have to reduce the side effect. Sometimes the patient not adherent because of side effect of the treatments. Sometimes there are comorbidities like comorbidities in uh, personality disorder or comorbidity and anxiety disorder or comorbid uh, substance use disorder, and this will cause treatment resistant depression. Reduce ongoing stressors. The patient is taking his medications, but the stressors in his work, in his family, on the society are too much that he will not feel improved. So we consider it as pseudo resistance. Pharmacogenic test, uh, testing for uh, cytochrome or Bamer 50 and check the medication interaction. Medication interaction, maybe he is using another drugs, he has comorbid medical condition or something, and this will interfere with the metabolism of our antidepressant, and he is not getting the all benefit of the medicine. 
we have to start illness specific psychotherapy. Sometimes a patient needs besides the treatment to do cognitive behavioral therapy or individual therapy. And then we have to evaluate the initial diagnosis. The patient was maybe not uh, measured depressive disorder. He maybe have bipolar disorder and there is attacks of bipolarity, but we didn't recognize or there is family history of bipolarity. And so uh, we have to expect this. Uh, the patient usually means we have to do some, uh, to uh, give some uh, and, uh, meaning for the, what we mean by response. Response means reduction of symptoms more than 50%. Remission means that the function restored and the residual symptoms less than seven in item in uh, Madras uh, in uh, Hamilton and less than 10 in Madras. And the recovery means that the remission is continuous and stable. The patient has recovered and stable for at least six months. Most depression doesn't respond adequately to single monotherapy trials. A star would uh, they provide some insights on the utility of combination of treatment. Sometimes miss, most of the patients will not respond to single monotherapy and we have to either augment the therapy or add another antidepressant. And the, uh, as we see here, that the patients about 37% uh, uh, will not are resistant to treatment. Only 30% improved and responded to treatment and 25% didn't respond to treatment. Here, the, uh, this uh, study was done on 2,762 patients. Another sample, there was only a responder about 65% uh, and the non-responder was 35% and the non-responder and the uh, treatment resistant were about 10 to 30%. This shows us how the magnitude of the uh, treatment resistant uh, depression. The rate of the response, only one third of patients achieve full remission after their first antidepressants of treatment. 30 to 45% failed to respond to an adequate trial of antidepressant. 10 to 15% show partial response, while 20 to 35% show non-response. This shows us how the rate of response is low and the rate of non-response is high for depressed patients. This is the same that uh, non-response is uh, 20 more than two, uh, 20, 25%, less than 25% improvement. If there is 25 to 50% this virtual response, if there were 40, 50% to 75% this is response, the remission, the patient have to improve more than 75%. The treatment resistant depression is very poorly defined term. It is failure to respond to trial for more than one of anti antidepressant drug in dose equivalent to 250 to, uh, to 300 uh, milligram of imibramine given for duration of six to eight weeks. Unremitting depression despite treatment with at least two different antidepressants or an antidepressants and a course of ECT. This means that if we give patients antidepressants for six to eight weeks uh, with full dose, more than one antidepressant, and the patient not improved, or we give him at least uh, two antidepressants and ECT and the patient not improved, this is, means that he has a treatment resistant depression. When do we characterize a response at treatment resistance? After a patient has been on antidepressants uh, for a, a, a reasonable amount of time and adequate dose, the same, uh, and he is not improved, no commonly accepted time point. Most of the drug trial data comes from eight weeks long studies. We have to give the patient at least eight weeks, two months 
to uh, say that he is uh, resistant depression or he will improve, he is not uh, resistant depression. Is achieving remission is important? Of course, because if the patient will not reach the remission, of course, the patients will high risk of relapse and the recurrence of suicidability will be higher and uh, the patients will try to attempt suicide. Also, the poor prognosis uh, will occur and there will be more functions of the patient in his work, in his family, and the catheters or general medical complication, for example, substance use disorder or cardiovascular disease, increase health service utilization, especially the patient will have the side effect of the, of the drugs or say he has another comorbid medical condition, or somatized depression, and he will use the service, uh, health service uh, more than a normal individual. Death from medical comorbids also will increase. This will show us that uh, patients with uh, impartial remission will be absent from uh, work for 63 days in a year, while it was a patient who is completely in remission, absent only for 20 days. That means that the patient in partial remission will be absent from work three times more than the patient who are in full remission. Failure to achieve remission is linked to relapse. If the patient has partial remission, we find that the rate of the relapse is second 67.6, while the patient in complete remission only it is 15%. Uh, so the patient is more, uh, uh, more linked to relapse. Also the failure to, re, uh, to achieve a, a remission will uh, increase the reduction of the gray matter volume. The patient who will not achieve a remission, there is a greater loss of gray matter in the brain. Also, this may affect also uh, the other systems. For example, the adrenal gland will release excess amounts of catecholamine and uh, cortisol, which will increase the uh, anxiety. Also, the hypothalamus will stimulate the pituitary gland to release excess anti-corticotrophic hormone and continuously driving to adrenal gland. Also, the cortical uh, gland will increase its secretion. Also, there will be increase in catecholamine, which will cause platelet activation, will increase in cytokinin and interkinin may also contribute to atherosclerosis. Also, the heart will be increased in catecholamine will lead to myocardial ischemia. So as uh, we see, treatment resistant depression will affect uh, systemic uh, systems, will affect as systemic consequence on different organs. So we can uh, summarize that treatment resistant risk will in increase uh, the comorbid pathologies, it will increase the residual symptoms, it will increase the risk of relapse, and there will be shorter time of relapse. The attacks will be uh, followed each one, uh, one each other uh, within shorter time. There is reduced in quality of life, there is functional impairment, there is greater uh, reduction of gray matter uh, volume. There is a clinical characteristic of treatment resistant depression. There is severity of depressive symptoms. There is disease chronicity, suicidability, psychotic features, psychiatric comorbidities, somatic comorbidities, and adverse life events, early age of onset. This is the characteristic of treatment resistant depression. There is severity of depressive symptoms and symptoms of depression will be severe and it will be chronic. The suicidability will be higher there will be psychotic features, psychiatric uh, comorbidity increase, whether anxiety or substance use disorder, somatic comorbidities, adverse life events, and early age of onset. Treatment of resistance depression versus pseudo-resistant depression. The first uh, task of the clini uh, clinician before labeling a patient 
as treatment resistant depression is differentiated between two treatment resistant depression from pseudo resistant. As we said, we have to see if there is comorbidity, if the patient is not adherent to the treatment, if the dose is not sufficient, if we have to revise our diagnosis. So uh, we have to revise everything before labeling our patient as treatment resistant depression. The process of rolling uh, out, uh, out uh, pseudo resistant uh, falls in three areas uh, in physician factors, patient factors, and accuracy of diagnosis. Features associated with treatment resistant depression there is incorrect primary diagnosis, as we said. There is other factors also which will cause the resistance of depression. There may be inadequate treatment of earlier episodes. The patient didn't take amount of uh, antidepressant, which is suitable for his condition. Also, there is primary medical diagnosis. There is hypercholesteremia, hypothyroidism, diabetes, Cushing syndrome, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and cerebrovascular disease, and seizure disorder. Comorbid psychiatric disorder. They like an anxiety disorder, which is commonly coexists with major depression. Increased likelihood of severe, anti, uh, severe depressive symptoms, suicide attempt, decreased responsiveness, and greater susceptibility to side effect. Substance abuse, personality disorder, eating disorder. These all are causes for the treatment resistant depression. We have to do careful uh, evaluation of the presence of unrecognized depressive subtypes. For example, psychotic depression. There may be, will not, of course, uh, not respond to antidepressants alone. It needs to add antipsychotic bipolar disorder. It needs a mood stabilizer. A typical depression, better response to MAO inhibitor. Seasonal affective disorder, poorer response to tricyclic antidepressants. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder, serotonergic antidepressants work better. So the uh, the unrecognized the subtypes of depression will also interfere with the prognosis of the depressive symptoms when treatment. There are also causes for resistance in the patient, for example, the compliance for the treatment, the difference in, in the individual in his metabolism, drug metabolism will differ from one patient to another. The nutritional status, deficiency in folate, thiamine, and vitamin B6, vitamin 12, power zinc, psychosocial stressors and poor, so, poor social support. And also there is physician factor, underdosing we give sometimes, usually most of the doctors, especially if it's not psychiatrists, when they have a patient with depression, usually they use underdosage of antidepressant. And this is something wrong. If it, we diagnose depression, we have to give the full dose. Inadequate length of treatment. Just if the patient improved or the patient have side effect, he will let, uh, he will stop uh, the medication. And these two factors, we call it pseudo resistance. There are medical conditions that can cause uh, depression. For example, tumors, infections, endocrine disorders, uh, hematological disease like anemia, leukemia, neurological disease, toxic uh, alcohol, nutritional deficiency, other, other, for example, most myocardial infarction. And also there are uh, comorbidity of a psychiatric disorder, drug abuse, personality disorder. There is co medical comorbidities, a gender difference. Of course, the female are more affected, are more resistant to treatment. Family history, if there is family history of bipolar, antidepressant, of chronic depression, the age of onset, if depression starts earlier, it means that most probably it will be chronic. The severity of the illness and the coronary, all these are factors that lead to treatment resistant depression. These are the, uh, of course, also the compliance and the unusual pharmacokinetic of the patient. And also the gender, the female gender is said to be more vulnerable due to greater prevalence of depression in women. The family history, there are studies showing that a positive family history is associated with early onset of depression and chronicity. 
guidelines on clinical investigations of uh, med medicinal uh, products in the treatment of depression. In clinical uh, pragmatic view, a patient has been considered suffering from treatment resistant depression when constructive treatment with two products of different pharmacological classes used for a sufficient length of time at an adequate dose fail to induce a clinically meaningful effect non-response. If the patient used two antidepressants for sufficient time, this means that he has a treatment resistant uh, depression. This approach assumes that non-response to two components with a distinct mechanism of action, for example, one anticyclic and one SSI, is more difficult to treat than non-response to two compounds with the same mechanism of action. If we use two classes of antidepressants and the patient not improve, this means that it is more difficult than if we are using the two drugs of the same uh, class. Moreover, it assumes that switch of treatment within one class is less effective than the switch of different pharmacological class. If the patient not improved on uh, one class of antidepressant and we want to switch, we have to switch to another class, not the same class. Uh, stage one, uh, this is this rush treatment resistant depression, uh, staging methods. This he put, uh, these are the stages of the treatment resistant depression. The stage one failure of an adequate trial of one class of measure antidepressant, stage two failure of adequate trial of two distinct uh, uh, different classes. Stage three, stage two plus failure of a third class of antidepressants. Stage four, stage three plus failure of an adequate trial of a uh, monamine oxidase inhibitor. Stage five, stage four plus failure of an adequate course of electroconvulsive therapy. How to deal with treatment resistant hypertension? We can do switching to another class combination, adding another uh, drug, augmentation, and brain stimulation and psychotherapy. The recommended strategy of treatment-resistant depression, treatment response should be evaluated every two to four weeks after initiation of antidepressant treatment. We have to evaluate our response every two to four weeks. A careful clinically guided choice of an initial antidepressant compound and a regular treatment monitoring may minimize the risk of insufficient response. And also we have further strategies are frequently needed in, also in order to achieve satisfactory treatment response. However, pseudo resistance should be evaluated at first. At first we have to uh, evaluate uh, the pseudo resistant and we have to follow up our patients carefully. We can do augmentation treatment either by lithium or cutapin XR are licensed for augmentation of treatment resistant depression in Europe. In USA, lithium cutabin, ariprazole, uh, brixiprazole, and olanzabine in combination with fluxine are licensed for augmentation of treatment resistant depression. Augmentation treatment, uh, second, uh, second generation of antidepressant and lithium are recommended as first option of treatment of resistant depression, uh, especially recommended for patient, especially if the patient has some psychotic feature. If the patient has suicide, lithium can be added much, much better. If we can do combination therapy, the evidence is rather uh, sparse. It is, uh, there are little evidence about this. Preference for combination with a reuptake inhibitors such as SSRI or SNRI and inhibitor inhibitors of presynaptic photoreceptors, they are like mercrazepine or serotonin antagonist and reuptake like trazodone. We can add it as a combination cell to our antidepressant. We can do dose escalation if no sufficient evidence that non response. Responders, responders and initial antidepressant trial benefit from a dose escalation of the same antidepressant drug. We can increase the dose, increase the dose until the patient will improve. If the patient not improve, we can do switching. Sometimes we have to use psychotherapy, whether cognitive behavioral therapy, whether interpersonal therapy. The cognitive behavioral therapy we have 
to uh, incre increase the patient uh, to know more about the stresses in his life, how to express his emotions, how to uh, understand his symptoms. This will lead to uh, much improvement with beside our medication. We know also electroconvulsive therapy. We now call it brain synchronization treatment. Uh, especially now it is done under anesthesia and muscle relaxant. And uh, of course, there is a little, uh, there is no uh, absolute contraindication. And the uh, side effects are minimal and uh, it is very effective treatment for depression. We can use transcranial magnetic stimulation, magnetic scissor therapy. Magnetic scissor therapy uses high dose of uh, recurrent uh, transmagnetic stimulation to induce scissor. It is inducing scissor, but be, uh, instead of using it with electricity like uh, brain synchronization treatment, we use it by uh, magnetic stimulation. As an advantage over ST and magnetic stimulation resist uh, treatment, it is associated with a more superficial stimulation which exerts less impact on the medial temporal lobe. To date, few research sites across the world have used uh, magnetic stimulation with concomitant uh, risk of open label trial. We can put vagal nerve stimulation. Vagal nerve stimulation uh, refers to electrical stimulation of cervical portion of the left vagus nerve. The vagal nerve stimulation, this shows us this is a vagus nerve. And we put here the lead implant here, the wire, and this is the lead, the implanted pacemaker, and this is the wire, goes to vagus nerve to stimulate it. And this can be used for treatment of resistant depression. The rib brain stimulation may, uh, some uh, Mayberg and his colleagues demonstrated that open label subcolosal uh, singlet uh, uh, deep brain stimulation was associated with antidepressants effects. There are novel agents to be used, like there are some drugs in the pipeline, for example, triple reuptake inhibitors. They are uh, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors. They can be used. Uh, also, there are several uh, different triple uptake inhibitors still in the pipeline. The unmet uh, needs in treatment of the treatment resistant depression, further non-pharmacological and of local of label treatments are necessary very often, lack broadly available, available effective treatment with quick onset of action and sustained efficacy. Novel promising substances are under approval process now. Further experimental therapies are in various stages of development. Still, we are in need of uh, more uh, drugs. We are in need to uh, more method of treatment to improve our patients. Then the blocker uh, sub anesthetic dose of ketamine can exert an immediate antidepressant effect in patients with treatment resistant unipolar or bipolar depression and can immediately uh, reduce suicidal thoughts. This is uh, ketamine, and this uh, FAD approves that new nasal. We use it as nasal spray medication for a treatment of resistant depression. Recommended strategy for treatment uh, resistant depression augmentation with second generation. way to uh, control the depression. In treatment resistant depression, there are non-pharmacological and off-label treatment are very uh, ne are necessary very often. Lack of effective, effective treatment with quick onset of action and sustained efficacy. Novel experimental therapy are in various stages of development. So we can conclude treatment resistant depression remains a common condition with 50 to 60% of the patients not achieve meaningful response following antidepressant treatment, early identification and use of effective long-term maintenance strategies are important. 
Non defined algorithm exists for treating resistant depression. Research in this area has advanced considerably in recent years. The development uh, of the treatment resistant anti depression is impacted substantially by disease factors as severity of depressive symptoms and chronicity, suicidality and psychotic symptoms uh, features, psychotic and somatic comorbidities, adverse life events, and Early, uh, early age onset and things. Thank you so much, Professor Montaz. It's, it's, it's as usual, very impressive, comprehensive, and it's, it's all clinical, which we all need. Thank you. They are all complementing each other, the talks. Uh, the, our last talk for this session today, this morning, uh, is by uh, our dear friend and colleague, Professor Tarek Okashan, who will talk about treatment-resistant depression. Dr. Tarek Akasha is very well known to us. He's a professor of psychiatry in the Institute of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine and Shams University. He is the director of the World Psychiatric Association Collaborating Center on Research and Training in Psychiatry. He is the president of the Egyptian Alzheimer's Society. He is the president of the Arab Board of Psychiatry. He is the chairperson of Higher Council of Universities Committee in Egypt for the promotion of assistant professors and professors in psychiatry. He was uh, an executive committee member of the World Psychiatric Association and secretary of scientific meetings. And uh, he has published more than 75 papers in national and international journals, contributed 25 national and international books. And he supervised more than 90 masters and doctorate degrees psychiatry candidates. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have Professor Okasha with us with the all other eminent speakers. The floor is yours, Professor Okasha, for your talk on treatment resistant depression. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to participate in the Abu Dhabi International Virtual Congress. I would like to take this opportunity and thank Dr. Mohammed El Garhi and Dr. Midhat Sabahi and all the members of the scientific and organizing committee for putting together such a powerful scientific program and Congress. My presentation today will focus mainly on treatment resistant depression. First of all, the World Health Organization stated that one in four people will suffer from a mental or a neurological disorder at some point during their lifetime. Also, that one in every seven will experience a depressive episode during their lifetime, which is quite high. They also mentioned that depression is eight times more frequent than schizophrenia and 16 times more frequent than Parkinson's. Also, the World Health Organization in its last report in October 2019 mentioned that one person dies every 40 seconds from suicide which is a very, very high number, leading to 1 million people committing suicide every year worldwide and 10 to 20 million people attempting suicide. 70% of these suicides are secondary to depression. Therefore, early diagnosis, early treatment, early intervention is essential in the management of depression in order to reduce the number of suicides that occur. In the report, they mentioned that the majority of suicides occur in low and middle income countries and that suicide is a public health problem and that it is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 29. Several decades ago, we were talking about suicide at the ages of 50 and 60. Then it became in the middle ages, around 30s and 40s. Now we're talking about the second leading cause of death among young people between the ages of 15 and 29. There are nearly th three times more men than women who die by suicide in high income countries. However, in low and middle income countries, the rate is equal. And we always have to remember that suicides are preventable. Therefore, our job is to ensure early intervention, early diagnosis and early treatment. The global burden of depression is present worldwide. There are more than 322 million people with depression, with an 18% increase between the years of 2005 and 2015, 
which means that between the years of 2015 and 2030, this percentage will increase, leading to an increased number of people suffering from depression. We have more than 54 million years of years lived with disability with patients, and it is the number one leading medical cause of disability in the world, as we will see by 2030. Also, we are all aware now that the most painful medical disorder is depression. We've all seen people with fractures, with tumors, taking medications, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, a lot of suffering. But the only disorder that the patient finds, the only relief from the pain of this disorder is by attempting or committing suicide, is depression. So we have to remember that depression is the most painful medical disorder. If we look at the non-communicable diseases, we'll find that neuropsychiatric disorders come number, 20, number one by 27%, followed by cardiovascular disease by 21%, followed then by cancer, endocrine disorders, musculoskeletal disease, and so on. Out of the neuropsychiatric disorder, the highest is depression. You are all aware of the disability adjusted for life years, that the number one cause of burden and disability adjusted for life years by the year 2030 is going to be depression, followed by ischemic heart disease, and followed by road traffic accidents. We have to be aware and tell our colleagues in different uh, uh, branches of medicine that depression is not just depression that presents to a psychiatrist, but it's depression that presents to multiple disciplines and in multiple disorders. So we've said that the prevalence in the general population is around 6%. In chronically ill patients, that means patients suffering from diabetes, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on, it is nearly 9.5%. In hospitalized patients, it reaches 33%. In geriatric inpatients, 36%. Cancer outpatients, 33%. Cancer inpatients, 42%. Patients suffering from stroke will suffer nearly 50% of them from depression, myocardial infarction 45%, and Parkinson's disease nearly 40%. That means that depression is not just a disorder that occurs on its own. It is also comorbid with many physical disorders. And the important point is that we are not just treating depression to improve the depression. But when we treat the depression, we're improving and increasing the percentage and the prognosis of recovery or improvement of patients with a physical disorder. Patients with diabetes and depression, if you treat diabetes on its own and leave the depression, the prognosis of the, the diabetes is poor. Therefore, it is essential to treat depression in order to improve the physical disorder. And also, treating depression is a protective factor from patients suffering from cardiac disease and ischemic heart disease and stroke. Depression leads to functional impairment. Nearly 87% exhibit at least, at least moderate impairment and 59% to 60% exhibit severe impairment. We have to be aware that patients with depression have decreased work productivity, social disabilities, and poor relationships with people, which affects their everyday living. Depression is a clinically heterogeneous disorder. That means there are three main items that we always look for, emotional, physical, and cognitive. The emotional includes the sadness, the anxiety, the irritability, the lack of enjoyment, the suicidal ideation, hopelessness, and guilt. The physical presentation, which is very common in the Arab world, where patients usually present to cardiologists, nephrologists, pulmonologists, and GIT specialists because of these symptoms, which are fatigue, weight loss, insomnia, sexual dysfunction, headaches, stomach problems, pain, psychomotor agitation, and so on, and also the cognitive symptoms with attention and concentration disabilities, short-term memory affection, decision-making problems, mental sharpnesses affected, speed of thinking, and judgment. We are all aware of this curve. It is important when we treat any patient that there is the acute phase of treatment which lasts approximately six to 12 weeks, during which we hope that when giving the medication, the patient first reaches a response, which is an improvement in 50% of the symptoms, then reaching remission, which is reaching the baseline once again. After that, from four months to nine months, we have what is termed a continuation phase of therapy till the patient reaches from remission to recovery. 
After recovery, there should be maintenance up to one year in order to try and prevent the occurrence of recurrence. Of course, we have to inform all our colleagues and us as psychiatrists, remember, once you prescribe an antidepressant, it should be prescribed continuously for at least one year before we start to decide to decrease the dose or change the dose. According to the work done six months after remission, nearly 25% of patients relapse. Five years after recovery, 58% of patients have a recurrence. And 15 years after recovery, 85% patients, 85 of patients will have a recurrence. That means there's a very high chance of recurrence if you're not treating depression properly. And we know now that after the first episode of depression, there's a 50% chance of another episode. After a second episode of depression, there's a 70% chance of another episode. And after three depressive episodes, there's a 90% chance of another episode. Therefore, adequate treatment from the first episode is essential to ensure a better prognosis of depression. There are many antidepressant medication and classes that are available, starting from the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants. Then we had the REMAs, the SSRIs, the SNRIs, and all the newer antidepressants that we are aware of. When we are treating depression, it is important to remember that pharmacology or pharmacotherapy on its own is insufficient. We need the help of psychotherapy, and there are many forms of psychotherapy which have been approved and have uh, evidence-based uh, results in the treatment of depression, such as supportive psychotherapy, cognitive psychotherapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, behavioral psychotherapy, <coughs> the new mindfulness-based psychotherapy, logo-oriented psychotherapy, brief dynamic psychotherapy, and we'd add exercise here as well. Of course, it's not a treatment on its own, but it's a very good adjuvant. We should never forget that we have physical therapies that can be used in severe psychotic suicidal depression, and we also have some of them which can be used as adjuvants uh, to medical uh, medication uh, in mild and moderate depression. So we have in Egypt now the uh, ECT or electroconvulsive therapy is being called brain synchronization therapy, BST, in order to decrease the stigma because it is no longer compulsive. Uh, so we have to remove this word which is stigmatizing this form of therapy. In Arabic, we call it Galaset Tandim Iqa al Mukh. We have rapid transcranial magnetic stimulation which can be used as an adjuvant to the treatment that we are giving for mucotherapy in mild and moderate depression. We have deep brain stimulation. Vagal nerve stimulation, which is more beneficial with epilepsy, uh, and our colleagues in neurology use it more than in psychiatry. We have recently the transcranial direct current stimulation. We have the theta burst stimulation and the magnetic seizure therapy. As you see, we have a big armamentarium of physical therapies which can be used in order to help our patients that are not responding to pharmacotherapy on its own or psychotherapy on its own or a combination of both of them. ECT has been found that the mode of action is by increasing the brain-derived neurotrophic factor levels in the brain. Before that, it used to be believed that it worked on neurotransmitters. Then they said it worked on the receptors. Now it has been proved that it increased the BDNF levels in the brain, which explains how it is beneficial in some cases of depression, some cases of mania, and even some cases of schizophrenia. The work done by David Nutt suggests that Asides of ECT increasing the level of BDNF, by the first two sessions it enhances dopamine, affecting the appetite and drive of the depressed patients. By the third or fifth session, <coughs> it enhances the norepinephrine, affecting energy and attention. And by the sixth or eighth session, it enhances serotonin, affecting cognitions and anxiety. It is very important to inform our junior doctors that any patient suffering from depression and receiving ECT <clears throat> we should remember that after the fifth session, we have improved appetite and drive and energy and attention, but we have not yet improved the depressive cognitions. Therefore, patients may attempt suicide in hospital, and we have to be aware about that. Then we have the difficult to treat depression, which forms or subdivided into two main items, resistant depression and treatment-resistant depression. 
Treatment-resistant depression means that there is a problem with the treatment itself, the patient is not responding. However, resistant depression means that the treatment is fine, but the depression itself has a problem. What do we mean by that? Resistant depression is sometimes termed pseudo-resistance. That means we are treating a patient that we have diagnosed as depression, but the diagnosis is not actually depression. There is something else underlying the disorder that is hindering the improvement. So it is not a problem of medication. This is a problem in the depression itself. It might be bipolar depression. It might be an anxiety disorder with depressive symptoms or mixed anxiety depression or full-blown picture of both anxiety and depression. A lot of patients are diagnosed with depression and with proper history taking and examination after that, we realize that the primary disorder is obsessive compulsive disorder. But because, especially in Middle East countries, when the obsessions are in the form of blasphemous thoughts or affecting uh, religious aspects, then the patient usually does not talk about it and suffers quietly until depression appears. The same thing with patients with social and anxiety disorder that present with depression. So when we aim at treating the depression, we are not treating the primary cause. That's why it's called pseudo-resistance. The problem is not with the management or treatment. The problem is the depression itself. We also have a group of people which are patients with substance abuse and depression. They present with depression. Then we find later on that there is a substance abuse, especially alcohol in the Middle East and in Egypt with uh, tramadol is very common. With personality disorders, of course, the commonest being borderline personality disorder with the chronic sense of boredom and the mood swings. So they may be misdiagnosed as depression at the beginning, given a treatment, but are not responding like patients with pure depression. Why? Because the underlying cause is something else. And finally, the depression that is secondary to organic causes like stroke, endocrinal disease disorders, especially uh, myxedema, neoplasms like cancer of pancreas, we'll find that all these conditions cause resistant depression. But as I mentioned, the problem is not the medication. The problem is that we have diagnosed depression, but there is something underlying this depression. Reaching the underlying cause and treating the primary cause is the most essential aspect. With treatment-resistant depression, it can be defined as major depression in adults who have not responded to at least two different antidepressant classes at a proper dose for at least two weeks, so sorry, at least six weeks each. Some people add to the definition and taking 12 monitored sessions of electroconvulsive therapy or brain synchronization therapy, but some people remove it. This is a problem with the guidelines because several guidelines keep ECT or BST as a, a treatment that is given if pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy fail. But in some countries, like in Egypt, for example, some countries in Europe, if the patient is suicidal, has severe depression, psychotic depression, we usually start with the ECT with the pharmacotherapy from the beginning. So it is debatable whether we want to put the definition of treatment-resistant depression as just two classes of antidepressants, or we want to add the ECT. It's a choice for everyone according to his work. Of course, the first thing when we have treatment-resistant depression, which means that the problem is with the medication itself, we have to revise the four Ds. We have to revise the diagnosis, the drug, the dose, and the duration. Only 60 to 70% of patients with major depressive disorder respond to antidepressant therapy, leaving up to a third of patients with treatment-resistant depression. It is also very important for us to be sure that the diagnosis is treatment-resistant depression, as we will see in a few slides, with proper history taking. In patients with treatment-resistant depression, symptoms persist for longer, which leads to a worsening of outcome, which can include suicidal ideation. The longer the patient suffers from helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, with the diurnal variation of symptoms, with the suicidal ideation, and the improvement is not happening, then the persistence of the symptoms increases the chance of suicide. Treatment-resistant depression has a substantial negative impact on functioning and quality of life. It is associated with increased symptom severity, it has a major effect on employment status, financial success, and interpersonal relationships. 
It is also associated with high number of days absent and, uh, for physical or mental disorder. It is associated with high occurrence of comorbidity conditions, heavily impacting on health services, and it decreases the life expectancy up to 10 years. So when we have patients with treatment resistant depression, we have to know that aside of the depression itself, it is affecting the quality of life of the patient. And our aim is not just to improve symptomatology or remove or checklist the criteria in the DSM or the ICD. We have to ensure that the patient, aside of the syndromic recovery, there has to be also a functional recovery because functional recovery equals quality of life of the patient. In assessing treatment resistant depression, we have Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. An inventory of depressive symptomatology is important. And more importantly, an antidepressant treatment history form or a short version of it which focuses more on the current episode. What does that mean? Usually when we see a patient in our outpatient clinic, we usually ask the patient after diagnosing depression, have you received any medication before? The patient will say, for example, I have received sertraline, I have received escitalopram, I have received paroxetine, I have received fenlafaxine. And we write down all these medications that have been taken, and then the patient said, but had not respond to any of them. However, we miss to ask the question, what was the dose and the duration of treatment of all these medications? Usually the response will be that each medication was taken for a few days or one or two weeks and was stopped either because of side effects or because the patient did not feel any improvement. But in order to diagnose treatment-resistant depression, then each one of these drugs in different classes has to be had taken in the full dose. It has to be taken in the proper duration. Otherwise, it is not considered treatment-resistant depression. So please be careful. When we take history of medication, we have to ask not just what is the name of the drug that you took and whether you improved on it or not. No, we have to ask what was the dose and what was the duration of each drug in order to ensure the diagnosis of treatment resistant depression. What are the pharmacological strategies that we can use with treatment resistant depression? First of all is maximization or optimization. That means increasing the dose of the medication that we are giving to the maximum or optimized dose. If the patient is taking fluoxetine, for example, then if taking 20 milligrams per day, we will go up to the maximum dose, which is 60 milligrams. If they're receiving fluvoxamine, for example, we have to go up to 300 milligrams. Sertraline, we have to go up to 200 milligrams, and so on. So first of all, the first thing we do is maximization optimization. If this does not work, then we start with combination. Combination is adding two different classes of antidepressants together, like SSRIs and SNRIs, two SSRIs together, a tricyclic with an SSRI, tricyclic with an SNRI. Of course, we have to be very careful about the doses and the drug interaction in order not to have any effect on the cytochrome P450, whether we increase the metabolism or decrease the metabolism of the drug. And we have to be very careful about the serotonin syndrome. The third strategy is augmentation, which is adding a different class of drug. The commonest three drugs that are used are lithium as an adjuvant with antidepressants, or thyroxine as an adjuvant to antidepressant, or second generation antipsychotics. And now, with the, the, a lot of people are uh, suggesting the use with antidepressants of second generation antipsychotics with an antidepressant action which means that it is a second generation antipsychotic with a built-in uh, antidepressant action like quetiapine, like uh, acenapine, uh, like uh, loracidone, and so on. After that, we have anti-epileptic medications, which can be added as well in order to try and improve this treatment-resistant depression. There are newer forms of antidepressants that are appealing now, and a lot of research is being carried on on drugs which are not related either to serotonin, dopamine, uh, serotonin, dopamine, or uh, norepinephrine, but are working on different aspects. For example, we have the esketamine, which is an end receptor antagonist, and it's supposed to go in the markets recently. Uh, uh, and we have the glutamate receptor modulators, 
which conclude non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonists. We have NR2B subunit and the NMDA receptor antagonists. We have NMDA receptor with glycine site partial agonist, and we have the glutamate receptor antagonists. All these are medications that are on, in the pipeline, which have a different mode of action than the classical neurotransmitters that we have. Some medications that are currently available that are used for other disorders have been discovered to have an antidepressant action. However, the side effect profile cannot be taken in patients with depression, but their mode of action can be mimicked, like scopolamine, which has a muscarinic cholinergic action, the propionophen, which has an opioid receptor action, the neurokinin 1, which uh, is available, like substance P neurotransmitter for pain, and the vasopressin. All these are also modes of action which have an antidepressant action, which people are working on to try and have these medications. This is a very interesting slide. This is called intracellular interneuronal and network effects of antidepressants. If you look at this slide, we will discover that in the future, we will no longer be talking about neurotransmitters. The idea of presynaptic, postsynaptic, the idea of the uh, vesicles, the neurotransmitter in the synaptic lift, then going to the receptor. After that, no. All antidepressants will act intracellular, interneuronal directly. So we'll have example like histone acetylation. It will work on the Krebs cycle. It will work on the BDNF, on the opioid receptors, on the NAMDA and AMPA receptors. As we see, all these different modes of action, nothing is related to dopamine receptors, serotonin receptors, nor epinephrine receptors, but it will work inside the cell. This will have two beneficial uh, aspects. First of all, the medication will start working right away. We will not have to wait for a few days or up to one week for the medication to start showing its mode of action. Secondly, the side effects that occur will be less because we're working intracellular and not through a messenger, which is the synaptic left at the receptor. In conclusion, inadequately treated depression may have a progressive course and result in structural changes in the brain. As we're aware, the longer the depression remains, we have decrease in the size of the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. And with early intervention and proper treatment with antidepressants, with neurogenesis, they go back to their uh, uh, size before the depression. Establishing the unmet needs in the management of depression in terms of response, remission, tolerability, with high emphasis on the unmet needs in achieving the functional recovery, which is more important than syndrome recovery, and the need for new effective antidepressants taking care of more than the mood. It is important to choose an effective treatment first because failure to achieve remission from the beginning may lead to more frequent relapses and future failures in the treatment and response. Future work is necessary to understand treatment-resistant depression as an illness or as an entity on itself, to adequately treat treatment-resistant depression and to ensure sustained response and continued remission. As I mentioned before, the aim of all this is not just to improve the criteria that are present in the DSM or the ICD, it's not to improve the symptoms of the patient, but it is into, it's to improve the function of the patient, what is termed the functional recovery, which equals the quality of life. And a better quality of life is our aim for all our patients. Thank you very much. Presentation, as usual. And... Uh... We have actually uh, a few minutes to cover a couple of questions. We have uh, two questions to Professor uh, uh, Hisham Rami, and uh, uh, it will be uh, our pleasure that he would uh, kindly answer them. I will just uh, tell the first question. I will wait for Dr. Hisham, and then we will talk about the second question. Uh, Professor Hisham, the first question is telling what's the relationship of neurotransmitter release and the release sites when we talk about modal depression and recovery from depression. Dr. Hisham, please. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, all, all uh, precious participants, I'm sorry that uh, we had some uh, technical issues and we could not uh, have Dr. Hisham with us. Professor Hisham, he was with us and he was willing to answer questions. So we're running uh, out of time, unfortunately. Thank you all for attending. 
thank you all for the uh, three eminent professors for their uh, wonderful uh, talks. And you will go for a short break and then uh, you can attend the posters presentations and we'll proceed with the second uh, session and the third and fourth. All my best wishes. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for the technical staff, for the organizing team. It was all wonderful. Thank you and have a good day and a tremendous conference. Thank you.